Good morning again on August, in August of 1998, in a place called Oma, Northern Ireland, a bomb went off, killing 29 people. One of them was a woman pregnant with twins. Another was, one was a one-year-old little girl named Brita. And this was the worst of the bombings that took place call, in a time called the Troubles in Northern Ireland. And, and the blessing that came out of it was it actually drove both sides to the peace table and endured a lasting peace that so far they've enjoyed in Northern Ireland. But at the time, the band U2, who's from Ireland, also a group of believers, wrote a song called Peace on Earth. And in it they wrote that they were tired and sick of people saying that there was ever going to be peace on earth. Niall Stokely, who's well known as one of their biographers, said it's the most agnostic song they ever wrote. The Edge, their guitarist, said it is the bitterest song we ever wrote. And some of you today are sitting here in this room or watching online and you're saying you're sick and tired of people saying that there's ever going to be peace on earth. And it's hard because we're full of anxiety, we're full of fear, we're full of worry. This has been one of the most difficult years uh, that I remember in my 37 years I asked my parents what they thought. They said it's one of the strangest years they've ever been in. Our peace has been radically disrupted, not just by a virus, but by so many other things that have taken place this year. And many of us are tired of it. We're tired of thinking that there's ever going to be peace on earth. And today we're going to look at Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. And the angels show up and they say, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And within this proclamation, there's a phrase that's uttered. In the city of David, there's a savior, a Messiah, a Lord who is born. And I want us to key in on those three titles, the savior, the Messiah, the Lord. And I want us to see how we can actually have peace on earth. And not a peace like other people talk about, but a distinctly Christian peace. Not one absence of conflict, but one that brings shalom. Which is this idea of wholeness, of completeness. In the verse that we're memorizing this week, in John chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus says, I am leaving you well and whole, that shalom, that wholeness. That's my parting gift to you, peace. So we're going to talk about the peace that a Savior can bring, the peace a Messiah can bring, and the peace that comes from the Lord. So let's look at the peace of a Savior. Thanks to to Linus. We all know this passage really well, right? If you've watched the, the Snoopy Christmas special. And so we're doing uh, this series from the message paraphrase. And the reason why we're doing that is we're all so familiar, many of us are so familiar with these Christmas passages that it helps to hear it in a different light. So let's read from verse 8. There were sheep herders camping in the neighborhood, and they had set night watches over their sheep. And suddenly God's angel stood among them, and God's glory blazed around them, and they were terrified. The angel said, don't be afraid. I'm here to announce a great and joyful event that is meant for everybody worldwide. A savior has just been born in David's town. A savior who is the Messiah and master. This is what you're to look for, a baby wrapped in a blanket and lying in a manger. And at once the angel was joined by a huge angelic choir singing God's praises. Glory to God in the heavenly heights. Peace to all men and women on earth who please him. What I want to do this morning, and I want us to look at these three titles. Because this is the only time in the New Testament... Where Savior, Messiah, and Lord, or Master, as it's written here, appear in the same sentence, in the same phrase. And it's based on these three titles that the angels are actually able to proclaim peace on earth and goodwill towards men. It's based on these offices, these roles that Jesus holds, that baby lying in a manger, the place that he has. It's based on those that the angels can say, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And the group that they're talking to, that this angel pronounces this to, is a group of shepherds. Now, we often think about the shepherds as a group and what they represent. If you look at writings on this passage, you'll see that sometimes the shepherds are represented as a group of outsiders because they're outside the city, and so they're people maybe outside of God's will and provision. They're symbolic that way, and that's a fine way to look at it. Some people will say that the shepherds represent the Jews and the gospel is going towards the, the chosen people of God and, and the, uh, the Gentiles are represented by the Magi, the wise men in Matthew's gospel. And so the gospel is going out to all the world. Still others would say that the shepherds represent the poor and impoverished. 
And that's a fair interpretation as well because the, the shepherds were certainly poor. They weren't wealthy. And on top of that, Luke's gospel is focused on the poor and the impoverished. But rather than this morning look at, looking at them as a group, what I want to do is I want us to look at them as individuals. Now, that's hard to do because we don't know them individually, but we can think about what kind of people these guys might have been. Some of them might have left that morning or that afternoon, that evening, as they went to tend their sheep overnight and had a bitter argument with their spouse. Their angry words to each other still ringing in their own ears and minds as they sit there in the dark. Maybe they were arguing over the fact that they couldn't have children. And the longing of a child, longing for a child, is all they have to think about while they sit there in the dark. Maybe one of those shepherds is waiting for the darkness to really seep in deeply so he can sneak off and go back to town because he's having an affair with another one of the shepherd's wives and he knows he's not going to be there that night. Maybe another one of the shepherds, his job, his responsibility is to take the sheep to market and whenever he gets paid something, he lies to the other shepherds and says that, you know what, I only got this much and he holds back some for himself and he's been stealing, embezzling from the other shepherds. Regardless of where they were or what they were doing that night, whether those were the egregious sins that I just listed or something less than in our account, these men were normal, humble Broken sinners, just like me, just like you. They weren't super saints. They weren't righteous people. They were normal everyday human beings and the angels appear to them. The angel appears to them and presents himself to them. And he says two things to them. One, what? Fear not. He says, don't be afraid in verse 10. He says, don't be afraid, which is really important. Really important because, again, remember, these are, are sinners. These are broken people. And God's glory is radiating around them. And he, although God's glory is beautiful and something to be desired, when you encounter it, it's something terrifying if you are not right with God. It is a terrifying beauty. And that's why everybody's afraid. In fact, Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6, witnesses the glory of God in the temple. And he says what? Woe is me because I'm messed up and I live amongst a messed up people. Is my translation. Things are messed up. He's afraid. So the angel says, no, no, don't, be, don't worry. I'm not here to exact any kind of vengeance. I'm not here to, to, to start the day of the Lord. I'm here with a good news message. And that's the second thing he says. I'm here with good news to you. Now that's, that to you is how it's read in the ESV. In the message paraphrase, it says, good news for everybody worldwide. And it is for everybody worldwide. But I want to focus on the Greek translation where it says, to you. Now, it's a plural to you, but it's specifically to the group of shepherds. A group of people made up of individuals. A good, the good news is that a rescuer has been born. A savior, somebody to deliver us from our brokenness. Somebody to deliver us from our sins. Somebody to deliver us from the things that we do that are self-destructive and destructive to other people. From our sinful condition. A savior that would establish shalom, peace, rest, wholeness. That's what a savior was in the Old Testament. God is frequently referenced as the savior. In fact, he's the only one referenced in the Old Testament as savior. He's the only savior in the Old Testament. And one of the primary ways that he rescues his people is from their accuser. From Satan. The name Satan actually means accuser. And one of the things that Satan does is he accuses us. He brings us before the Lord and says, these are broken, busted, messed up people that regularly flaunt your commands and your will and you should destroy them. And Jesus steps in and says, mm -mm. no. Your wrath was satisfied on the cross when I took it for them. I am their savior and so there is peace between them and God. That's the savior, that's the rescue, that's the peace that we have as believers. And if you're not a follower of Christ, you don't have that peace, but you can have it today. You don't have to wait. You have to wait to open this gift like you wait on Christmas. You can open it today because Jesus died to bring peace between you and God. And for those of you who are believers, God never looks angry on you again. Never looks disfavorably on you again. And today you need to hear that peace has come in the form of a savior. 
born in Bethlehem to you. Jesus paid that price. And it's the only kind of peace that can come from a savior. A savior who is a God who can make that happen for you and for me. So we need the peace that comes from a savior. Now you might be sitting there thinking, Travis, okay, cool. Like I get it. I've done broken things. I've done messed up things. But there are things that happen to me that disrupt my peace that have nothing to do with anything I've done. They're not my fault. You're kind of like Job sitting there being like, look, I know, like God, some, but I, I didn't do anything wrong this time. And that's why we need the peace of a Messiah. We need the peace of a Messiah. Oftentimes the thing that comes and robs us of our peace are the things that aren't our fault. They're circumstantial. They're experiences that happen to us. The shepherds would have experienced that as well. Their peace was largely wrapped up in that flock, right, that they had. That was everything for them. Those were their wages. That was their retirement plan. That was their livelihood. That was their community, the other shepherds. Everything was tied up in those little four-legged woolly things. And if they lost them, they lost their peace. So they were worried about things like disease, blight. They were worried about thieves, about wolves. And that, I'm sure, created a great deal of depression and anxiety. They wouldn't have called it that because they didn't have labels like that as much, but it would have been just a very depressing and anxious way to live your life. Roller coaster, up and down. We face those things too. We're just like the shepherds. Our comforts, our livelihood, the things that really bring us peace are kind of like responsibilities that we shepherd over, right? Right? And we keep watch over them and we try to keep them secure. The things that are valuable, that are precious to us, we shepherd, we try to steward, we try to be responsible for, we try to take care of it. And what I think is really interesting is that despite the insurance plans we have, the security systems we have, the locks, the bank accounts, the fraud protection, the hand sanitizer, the masks that we all wear, we are the most secure generation who's ever lived. We have an unparalleled level of security. Some of you have three, four locks on your door. You got car alarms. All these things. I can shake your hand and then go squirt some gel in my hand to make sure I don't get your cooties. And you know what? I'm the most secure generation in history. Why don't I have peace? Why am I still not at peace despite all the security I have? And here's why we don't have peace. Because we don't find our peace in a person. We find our peace in a plan. We find it in a policy. Find it in a program. We don't find it in a person. Look at verse 11. A savior has just been born in David's town. A savior who is the Messiah and master. This is what you're to look for. A baby wrapped in a blanket and lying in a manger. Why does he bring up it's in David's town? That's an interesting reference. These were shepherds who worked outside of Bethlehem, right? That'd be like somebody appearing to you and being like, behold, there's a good restaurant in the Big D. Like, we're right here. You know, like this is where we live. We get it. No, the David's town reference is important because if it's David's town, then that's where the Messiah would be born. The Messiah was one who was promised. He was gonna be a descendant of David, the greatest king Israel had ever known, the David and Goliath David, that guy knew a thing or two about rescuing people. And he was going to, the Messiah, the one who was going to come and rescue everybody from everything was going to be born in David's town. And the shepherds, one of the things that disrupted their peace was the oppression that came from foreign invaders. First it was the, most recently it was the Romans and before that it was the Greeks and before that it was the Persians and before that it was the Babylonians, before that it was the Assyrians, before that it was the Egyptians. They were constantly oppressed by foreign powers. And a Messiah was going to come and throw off those, that oppression. He was going to throw off those things. So let me ask you this. What oppresses you today? What's disrupted your peace? Is it fear? Is it anxiety? Is it worry? We have a lot to be scared of today. We have a lot of things that have disrupted our peace. A lot of things that have thrown us off of our game. There's a little tiny microbe that you can't even see that has thrown us completely off of our peace game this year. Something so small has shown us how precarious our peace is balanced. It's amazing. 
And we, what we do is we look to false messiahs. In Jesus' day, throughout his lifetime, revolutionaries would rise up and they would claim to be the Messiah, the promised one. And you know what would happen? They'd rebel against Rome for a little while and then they'd be executed. That's even what they say in the book of Acts about Jesus. They're like, look, we've had tons of people claim to be the Messiah. And this is the Jewish leaders talking. These are not fans of Jesus. They say, if it's God's plan, if this is God's doing, if Jesus really is the Messiah, then we're not going to be able to stamp this revolution of Christianity out. It's going to go because all the other ones have been stamped out. We have false messiahs too. Our job, our health, our finances, our health care plans our ability to give gifts, our pleasures, our comforts. These are all false messiahs. And when they're taken from us, we find ourselves even lower than we've ever been before. And Jesus says, stop seeking out the false messiahs. Let them go and let me be your messiah. Bring to me your needs of peace. Or maybe it's, maybe it's not the whole like finding a messiah in something else. Maybe for you, you think you are the messiah. And you're the messiah for other people. You think you've got to be super employee or super employer. You think you've got to be super child or, or super father, super mother, husband or wife. You think everything rides on you. I want you to do me a favor. You're in your mask here if you're in the, in the room. So like people won't hear you. It's really easy to do. I want you to whisper to yourself, I'm not the Messiah. And that simple confession can be really helpful. We laugh. But how many of us really think that Everything in our life depends on us. Those things aren't going to deliver you and you're not going to deliver anybody else. Now, God may use you, sure. But I think we get caught up in God using us more than we get caught up in God actually delivering us, thinking that we're needed to be the deliverer and God wants to use us that way. Maybe. But in the process, he's also going to rescue us. And maybe some of you are sitting here today being like, Travis, I I just can't. Like, I cannot take that step of giving Jesus my need for peace because I'm afraid of what's out there in the dark. There are things out there in the dark that are going to come and take my stuff. And I'm afraid that if, if, if I let them, if I let my guard down, if I trust Jesus, he's not going to come through for me. And maybe you don't need to be a shepherd for a while. Maybe you just need to be a sheep. Maybe you just need to let God care for you. And what I would say to you, if you're worried about something coming in and robbing you of your peace. You know what else the shepherds that night had to rely on every night they were guarding their sheep? The other shepherds. Even though they couldn't see the other shepherds in the dark, they trusted and believed that the other guy was across the pasture watching the areas that they couldn't see. I gotta believe that guy is there even if I can't see him. And I would say the same thing for you. We've got to believe that Jesus is there in the midst of the darkness, watching over us and watching over the things that that we are responsible for and that we care for. Because the Messiah was was going to be called a good shepherd. And Jesus calls himself that. He calls himself a good shepherd. Look at what it says in Ezekiel 34. God says, I'll appoint one shepherd over them, all. My servant David, that's the Messiah, he'll feed them. He'll be their shepherd and I, God, will be their God and my servant David will be their prince. I, God, have spoken. Let Jesus be your shepherd. Stop trying to be the shepherd and be a sheep for a while. One of the great struggles we have in our our lives, I think, especially here at Park Cities, is so many of you have been told from a very young age that you're a leader or you're groomed to be a leader. You've been groomed your whole life. And you've been a leader for a long, long time in your life. You're captain of a football team or, or, or something like that. And then it just kept going through college and president of fraternity and sorority. And now you're a CEO or whatever it is that you do. And you've been a leader for, for so long, you've forgotten how to follow. You've forgotten how to be a follower. Go back to being a sheep for a while. It's what our Messiah needs us to do. It's what we need to do to follow him. And I'll tell you this, yes, sometimes God allows things to happen to us that, that destabilize our peace. I'm not going to sit here and lie to you and say that if Jesus is your Messiah, everything goes great. It doesn't. But the point of the baby in the manger is this, that God draws near to us. And that when we lose, he loses. When we hurt, he hurts. When we grieve, he grieves. He's not a God far off. That was the thing about the shepherds with their sheep. They held those sheep in community. 
If Bob the shepherd lost a bunch of sheep, it wasn't just Bob who had it taken out of his wages. All the shepherds lost. And when we lose, we grieve with you as a church. When you hurt, we hurt with you. And when you hurt, the Messiah grieves with you. That's the point of the incarnation. God with us, Emmanuel drawing close to us. And I find that peaceful. I find that comforting. I can hurt if I know I'm not going to hurt alone. I can hurt if I've got something to rest in and someone there for me. And we have to believe that Jesus is there even if we can't see him in the dark. Just like those shepherds did. You might sit there and again and say, Travis, I'm watching this and I want to believe this. Like it sounds good, at least I hope it sounds good to you. But how can I get it guaranteed? Well, that's why we need the third title. Jesus is Savior, Jesus is Messiah, but we need the peace of the Lord. Look at verse 13. At once the angel was joined by a huge angelic choir singing God's praises. Glory to God in the heavenly heights. Peace to all men and women on earth who please him. Now, If you know a thing or two about the spiritual realm, the physical realm, uh, in in dealing with scripture, we don't usually see angels, right? And if you do, well, that's cool. Or you might want to talk to somebody about that uh, if you're seeing angels. We don't usually see the angelic realm, the spiritual realm. But in this particular moment, the, the, the party, the celebration of the proclamation of the birth of the Messiah is so great that the heavens rip open. It's almost like the heavens, the spiritual realm can't contain the celebration. And so it's like the doors just blow off of heaven and it's like, boom. Here's the celebration for a while. You ever been riding down the road and somebody's like blasting their music really loud and despite the fact that your car has like zero road noise, for whatever reason, you can hear Lil Wayne playing from like three lanes over? That is what this is like. The heavenly realms got it cranked up to 11 and they are hearing everything. You don't celebrate like that unless the victory is certain, right? Right? As you know, I'm a baseball guy. You don't celebrate a single in the first inning the same way you celebrate a walk-off home run in the 12th. Two totally different celebrations. This is like bottom of the 12th celebration between these angels. You don't celebrate like this unless it's guaranteed, unless it's certain. And that is what it means when they say the Lord has been born. Because when the Lord attaches his name to something, he's guaranteeing it. He often says in the Old Testament, I am the Lord, I am the Lord, I am the Lord. Do this, I am the Lord, go here. I am the Lord. Do this sign. I am the Lord. Follow me here. I am the Lord. When the Lord attaches his name to something, it's a guarantor. It's a, this is going to happen. I'm with you. And notice what he says here. It says, the angels appeared. It says, at once the angel was joined by a huge angelic choir singing God's praises. It's the heavenly hosts. And often when God attaches his name to something, this heavenly host is like like an angel army. It's kind of how the, the, the message writes it. It's this angel army. And often when God talks about being the Lord of hosts or the God of the angel armies, it's in the prophets, in the latter uh, chapters of the Old Testament. And it's usually something to do with judgment. Like God's going to show up and judge and he's going to bring the army with him. But in this case, that's not what's happening. It's not what's happening. It's a celebration. And I think there's enough similarities. There's enough parallels between what's happening here in Luke 2 and an Old Testament passage that I want us to look at. It's in Zechariah 10, three through six. And I'm gonna read it out of the the ESV because I think the literal, a little more literal translation uh, captures a few things that I wanna key in on. Verse three, my anger is hot against the shepherds. Now the shepherds uh, were Israel's uh, religious leaders, their political leaders that had led them astray. And I will punish the leaders for the Lord of hosts, there's that term, cares for his flock, the house of Judah, and will make them like his majestic steed in battle. And from him, from Judah, shall come the cornerstone, the Messiah. From him, the tent peg. From him, the battle bow. From him, every ruler, all of them together. They shall be like mighty men in battle, trampling the foe in the mud of the streets. They shall fight because the Lord is with them, and they shall put to shame the riders on horses. I will strengthen the house of Judah, and I will save the house of Joseph. I will bring them back because I have compassion on them and they shall be as though I had not rejected them for I am the Lord, their God, and I will answer them. See how he attaches his name to it. This is gonna happen because I'm the Lord, their God. Zechariah is what it's called, one of the post-exilic prophets. It means he wrote in a time in Israel's life where they had been exiled to Babylon and they'd come back and they were looking at, God, what are you gonna do next? Because it seems like everything's terrible. And Zechariah and Malachi are the two last prophets to prophesy in the Old Testament. And then there's 400 years of silence. And pretty much the next time a proclamation is made to a group of people is here. 
in Luke chapter two. And who shows up? The Lord of hosts, or the hosts rather, the host of which the Lord is the commander to a bunch of shepherds and a proclamation of the Messiah is gonna be here. Now again, I'm not saying that Luke two is a reference to Zechariah 10, three through six. What I am saying is one of the last thing God tells Israel, he shows up and sort of says, hey, look, remember the guy that made the promise about removing the evil shepherds and putting his own guy in place and I'm gonna be their shepherd? That guy, the Lord, the God, the Lord of angel armies, that one, yeah, he's here and it's happening. And he makes the proclamation to a group of shepherds. That can't be a coincidence. That has to be something that God is saying to us and to you today. That the God who makes promises 400 years before they happen is the God who delivers on them and never fails to deliver on them. The God who promises to you, that promise to the shepherds, promises to you today as well. And he is the Lord and he will bring it about. And what I want to say to you today is I wish I could give you an outline and be like, boom, here's three steps to peace. That's not how it works. That's not how peace operates. And I think you'd know that. And I think if I did that, I think you'd think I was wrong. If you want to have peace from a savior, peace from a, a, a Lord, peace from a Messiah, you got to trust him for it. You got to have faith. And it's hard because 2020 has beaten the faith right out of us. At least it feels that way. It's difficult. And if you're having a hard time having that faith, having that trust, you know where that faith comes from? The same Lord who gives peace and he wants you to have it. He doesn't withhold from people who ask. And so go to him and say, Lord, I don't have the faith to have peace in you, but I want it. Can you give it to me? Please give it to me. And pray with expectation. Pray with hope. Pray for peace and pray for faith. And that's what he has to offer today. We need peace in our life. We need the peace of a savior who's gonna rescue us from our sins, the monsters of our own making. He wants to rescue us from those things. But he also wants to rescue us from the circumstances, the things that go wrong. And maybe he doesn't always deliver us from those things in this life. Maybe he allows us to go through difficult times. But ultimately we will be delivered from those things when our Messiah returns. And we need the peace of a Lord, a God who can promise us things and guarantee that they're gonna happen. On September 11th, 2001, y'all know what happened. Plane struck the World Trade Center, the Pentagon. It was a very disorienting time, not just for us as Americans, for the entire world. A disruption of peace in the entire community. And you too, same band, did a benefit concert for the uh, first responders, the, the people who were lost in the collapsing of the World Trade Towers. And in their concert, they sang again, Peace on Earth, but they changed a lyric. They went from singing, I'm sick and tired of hearing that there's ever going to be peace on earth, and they changed it to, I'm sick and tired of hearing that there's never gonna be peace on earth. You see the change, the change to optimism, the change to hope. They left behind their bitterness and I say to you, be tired this year, not of hearing peace on earth, but of hearing that there's never gonna be peace on earth. Be tired of hearing what a crisis this year has been because God is doing great things even in the midst of crisis, even in the midst of suffering, even in the lack of peace that we sometimes have. And today we're gonna take the Lord's Supper. We're gonna remember that that little baby grew up, lived a perfect life, lived sinlessly and died so that we could have peace with him. And we're gonna reflect on that. We're gonna remember that. And I think it's appropriate that we call it the Lord's Supper, the supper of the one who guarantees for us that we have peace with God, peace amongst men, in whom his favor rests. Let's pray. Gracious God and heavenly Father, what great hope we have in you. And it's not just hope that things will be fine. It's not just hope that things will be okay. It is hope for peace. And peace is not the absence of conflict. Peace is a wholeness, a flourishing that takes place. And we know that one day our Savior, our Messiah, our Lord will return and bring peace. And we look forward to that day. Lord, we ask that day would come. We ask that that day would come even before Christmas, that as we're celebrating and remembering your first advent, we remember and look forward to your second We'd be remiss not to pray that it would happen. And Lord, as we take the bread and the cup, 
this morning, I ask that you would be present amongst your people, that we draw close to you and that your grace would be poured out upon us, that we might experience and know you well, and that we would find peace today. It's in your son's name we pray, Father. Amen.